Beloved in Christ, in C2 today, I want to share this word that I spoke about briefly at the beginning of worship, but we're now joining you just now across the courtyard. I know that there are some of you in C2 this morning who have lost your home or your roof or you have a neighbor who has, and I'm so terribly sorry we all are for your loss. We are your community church and we are praying for your recovery. But I also want you to know, and all of those of you who are online and those of you who are here in house, that whenever you are going through something that has um, an emergency need, please let us know. And especially now, we have a deacon's fund at the church for one-time gift of support. Um, so you may have a medical need or a housing need or food or anything at all. Please be in contact with me this week for a confidential conversation and we will support you through this time of trial. Please pray with me. We thank you, God, for this day and all that's in it. We thank you that you have brought us to this place. Whatever we're going through or whatever we're up against, you are our God and the Lord of our life and we're so grateful. We're grateful for our children here today to be baptized and for their families, their grandparents and great-grandparents and the generations yet to come looking for hope for a new day. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be an acceptable offering for you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. We're so grateful. Amen. This past week, I watched one of my favorite all-time movies, The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. Have any of you read it or seen it? It's a, both a book and a movie. The setting is 1946, post-World War II, on the once German-occupied island of Guernsey. Somebody told me after the first service that they had just returned from a tour there. It's just off the coast of England. An English author from London takes up correspondence with a pig farmer from Guernsey who came across one of her books in a bombed-out bookstore with her address and name pinned just inside the cover. What follows is a thoughtful story of recovery from the trauma and the losses of war. There's a sharp contrast in this film between the desire for post World War II prosperity and exuberant joy, champagne is shown flowing, and a wrenching undercurrent of grief among those who lost all they held dear. Their response to external anxieties and trauma they could not change was to give all that they had for the sake of one another that all might live. Today marks the beginning of our annual invitation to generosity. And you may be looking at your calendar saying, I thought that happens in February. You may recall that we talked uh, earlier last year about moving stewardship from February after the first of the year to early fall before we have a chance to create a budget and then to resource, know how we can resource the ministries of our church going forward. So this is long been planned, you'll be receiving in the mail this week an invitation to express your response to God's generosity through your annual pledge to the church. Now this long planned invitation couldn't have come at a worse time, some of you might think, and others of you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe I showed up today for Stewardship Sunday. <laughs> but in fact, it couldn't have come, this invitation, at a better time. Paul talks about generosity at the close of his letter to the people of the church at Philippi, a church in leadership transition, a church uncertain about its future. They've been through some kind of an unnamed challenge that threatened to tear them apart. But instead, they've come together through their love of God and their commitment to follow this way of Jesus. Paul thanks them for their generosity that makes the continuation of his work possible, and he commends them for caring for one another in community. Paul wrote to them, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things... We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And our God will satisfy every need according to God's riches 
in glory in Jesus Christ. Paul wants the church at Philippi to understand that we are first and foremost utterly dependent on God to see us through every circumstance, through every triumph and every tragedy. And as we said last week, by virtue of our baptism, when one of us triumphs, we all triumph. When one of us suffers, we all suffer. We're all in this together because we belong to each other. And Paul wants them to understand that while he needs and deeply appreciates their generosity that makes possible his continuing work, our God, the source of all of our life, is ultimately the one who will satisfy all of our needs. Secondly, when the community turns from wrangling over their issues and problems to a renewed commitment to being of one body, one mind, one spirit in Christ— the power of their work to change lives then returns through their love for one another and their church through their generosity of spirit and resources. Paul reminds them that God will supply their every need. When they're generous, they don't have to worry about their future. They don't have to be afraid. We've lived together through many challenging seasons in the five years we've shared for many of us, COVID-19 is a receding memory, new incidences of the virus recoverable for most, now mostly in unwelcome inconvenience like the flu. Yet it was just three weeks ago that I presided at the funeral of a mentor who died from complications of COVID-19 in a hospital far from his home. While most of us got through Hurricane Milton with downed branches or an uprooted tree, Others in this congregation lost everything. Or they have a neighbor next door or down the street who did. To date, some among us still don't have electricity or internet, and it will be weeks or months before some of our homes and neighborhoods recover. And then there's a coming election. Have you heard that? No matter how we plan to vote... We all share a mutual concern that there may be negative consequences for family relationships around the Thanksgiving table. For our communities and for the future of our nation, we pray, we vote, and we wait with no small measure of anxiety for the outcome as those who watch storm clouds on the far horizon draw near. Now, we may have little control over war waged between nations, Nobody's asked me to be on an international cabinet so far. An international pandemic, divisive national politics, or devastating storms. But we do have extraordinary power to impact the course of our lives and the future of our church. Looking to the future is the path of hope. Looking to the past is the path of regret. Someone remarked to me this week, that living in the past is like trying to rebuild a new house by sawing sawdust. No matter how hard we lean into the past, it can never be more than dust in our hands. Now, I'm as guilty of ruminating over the past as anybody, primarily to consider how I might think or respond to situations differently should they happen again. Sometimes I have regret and thank God I and you and all of us are forgiven. We humans also have a tendency to live in the real estate of our minds far out into the future. As you might imagine, those of us who are your ministers talk frequently about what is God's future for us and where are we going and how are we going to get there together. We already know why we're here. We talk about it all the time. To embody the love of God in the world by following the way of Jesus. Now, there are two essential questions we may ask now that we know our why that guide our what and our when. The first question is this. What time is it? The answer is now. The second question follows, where are we? The answer is here. Whatever has happened in the past, whatever yet will be, God is with us here 
And now, as we throw in our lot together, these young parents are throwing in their lot with us and promising in a few minutes to raise their children in the faith. We're recommitting our lives and our resources for the sake of one another and for the glory of God. Whatever you're going through, because God is with you, you're going to be all right. Let me say that again. Whatever you're going through, because God is with you, you are going to be all right. Because God has been generous with us, we can't not be generous with others. And when we're generous with others, God will satisfy all our needs. Then whatever happens, we're all going to be all right. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ who is Lord of the living and of the dead. So here's the deal. Many of us may recall that time when we've been threatened with the loss of everything we hold dear. In those moments, we've had the chance to rethink what matters to us the most. We, who are the church the world needs today, need every one of us to lean into our future to the greatest extent of our capacity in order for us to recover and to thrive. There has never been a more critical time than now, and there's never been a more important place than here. Churches like ours are under attack across the nation. Churches with unwavering commitment to extravagant hospitality towards all. Courageous Christians willing to explore hard questions about the shape of a flourishing life. Creative Christians who celebrate music and the fine arts and who think outside the box to share God's good news with all who are in need of it. Though our faith is more than 2,000 years old, we believe God continues to shed truth and light on the issues of our time. Therefore, we remain curious about God's imaginative vision for humanity and Christ's invitation for us to participate in it. As compassionate Christians, we empower initiatives that create opportunities for the last and the least to thrive according to their passion and purpose on earth as in heaven. Imagine what the landscape of our world would look like if no more of our steeple crosses graced the skyline. So I'm asking you to think differently this year about your generosity to God through the church in response to God's generosity towards you. Whatever the future may hold, friends of this church and members alike, I invite you to invest in the future of this church, your community church, sacrificially, according to your capacity, whatever that may be. For those of you who have lost everything, pledge a dollar a week until you get a roof back over your head. For those of you blessed with abundance far greater than your need, give generously accordingly. You alone know God's generosity in your life and your capacity to respond so that churches like ours will still be here when these young boys grow to manhood. It's tempting in times of uncertainty to hold back and wait and see, to make our giving conditional on a particular outcome we want or prefer. Faithful giving is giving without counting the cost, without conditions, trusting that God will continue to provide us as we trust in God's ongoing care. Many years ago, a church member named Lucille once shared with me the following insight. Her favorite part of every meal was dessert. I really loved that woman. Whenever we went out to eat, she always ordered and ate her dessert first. She said to me, when you get to be 78 years old, you fill up quickly. I always want to have dessert, so I just eat that first, and I'll take the rest of the meal home if I have to. Lucille followed that same principle in her generosity to the church. The first check she wrote every month after she received her Social Security and small pension was to the church. 
She said, I don't have a lot of money, and it's so easy to spend it all and have nothing left for God. What I've discovered, she said, is this. When I really put God first, I end up having enough for everything else that I need. I don't know how God works, she said, but I do know that things work out better whenever I put God first. We put God first when we invest in our life together with whatever we have for the sake of each other for the glory of God. So return with me now for a moment to the beleaguered residents of Guernsey, England, who lost husband, wife, daughter, child, home, livelihood in the war. They sent all their children away by boat in advance of the occupation, watching their hope disappear on the horizon. Their adversaries took their livestock to feed their troops, leaving them with a few potatoes to plant and harvest, nearly starving them with nothing to eat but potato peels for the duration of the war. Yet they leaned in together, choosing life. One woman still had a home and offered her house as a gathering place. Another scavenged books for the group to read, and still another cared for a neighbor's child who had been arrested and disappeared. They all gave what they had that all might live. God loved your community church into being and walks with us through every circumstance. The future of your community church is now in all of our hands. Will we choose God's preferred and promised future for this community church our world needs today or not? God opens now a fresh opportunity for the legacy of our faith to inform and shape the generations that will follow us. Together we invest in our community church a beacon of hope that God's preferred and promised future for humanity might flourish for a new day. May it be so. Amen.